tonight then for the remainder of our time. Let us return to these verses that we just read from Joel. We began reading from Joel chapter 2 at verse 28, and we went on to read all through chapter 3 to the end to verse 21. We have been looking at this minor prophet, Joel, for the last few Wednesday evenings, and I do believe this is now our fourth sermon from this book. And this book may be roughly divided up into three, basically, broadly, along the three chapters that we have here. The first chapter deals with the immediate day of the Lord, and there Joel was bringing to the attention of, his, of the people of the day that the present calamity that they were going through was to be reckoned a day of the Lord, a day when God was visiting and chastising his people. And the particular events that he focuses on was the famine and was the devastation caused to the vegetation by the locusts who decimated the land with their activities. And that's taken up in chapter 1, where we noticed that was the immediate day of the Lord. There, the prophet was bringing God's word to bear to them in an, in an immediate sense. They were to look at the event, and they were to realize this was from heaven. The second chapter, we notice that Joel was telling them and prophesying that there was going to come another day of the Lord. It was imminent. God was going to visit his people again in judgment. It was in the future, but it was not too far in the future. And this time it wasn't going to be locusts. It was going to be a locust of armies, an army from Assyria. And they were going to devastate the land just like the locusts did, but in a different manner. But nevertheless, God was going to be merciful. The invaders would seek to capture Jerusalem, but they would not be able to. The Lord was going to intervene, and he brought about a great deliverance. And we noticed that last week, for that happened during the reign of King Hezekiah, when the Assyrians surrounded Jerusalem, and it looked as if it was curtains. An angel of the Lord came and brought about the death of 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers. So Jerusalem was spared, although Judah indeed had been devastated by the northern army from Assyria. And the bulk of what's left in chapter 3 and a few verses from chapter 2, we're inclined to believe focus on the ultimate day of the Lord. The ultimate day of the Lord. And the ultimate day of the Lord is to be regarded the day when the Lord Jesus Christ shall return in power and in great glory. It is true that some commentators interpret some of the words that we find in chapter 3 referring to the time when the Jews came back from captivity from Babylon. And that's perfectly possible, perfectly possible, because very often when these prophets prophesied, there would be more than one fulfillment of the prophecy. Sometimes it was fulfilled almost immediately. Other times there may be a partial fulfillment in the future, pointing forward to a full and permanent fulfillment in the far-off distant future. And therefore, that's the way that I want to look at these verses that we read tonight. Although they may have reference to the time when the Jews came back from captivity from Babylon, yet ultimately, they point to the ultimate day of the Lord, when the Lord Jesus Christ will return. Now we just remind ourselves that the day of the Lord is a day when God does visit. He visits his people either in judgment or in deliverance. 
and he might visit the surrounding nations in judgment. But nevertheless, it is to be regarded as a day of the Lord, a day when God moves mightily on behalf of his people, or indeed to chastise his people. Israel, for instance, when they were taken out of Egypt, may well be regarded as a day of the Lord, the day when the Lord displayed his something of his glorious and wonderful power that he was able to bring out the armies of Israel and all the people from the grip of Pharaoh. Gideon fighting against the Midianites with his 300 against the vast army of the Midianites. Again, that could be regarded as a day of the Lord, a day when the Lord moved mightily for his people. And the various victories that the judges secured in the book of Judges, that also can be regarded as another or other days of the Lord. And I've already referred to the destruction of the Assyrians during the reign of King Hezekiah. Well, we want to look then at these verses. And the title I want to give to our meditation tonight is Expecting the Day of the Lord. Expecting the Day of the Lord. And we are looking at this, and we are looking at a prophet who prophesied some 800 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he truly, he has got on him a telescope. He's looking away into the future. And what he sees here, we're inclined to believe, is not only the birth of the gospel church, it's not only the, the coming of the Spirit of God on Pentecost, but he's looking to that day in the future when the Lord Jesus Christ will return in great power and in great glory. That's what he's seen. And it's amazing what the Lord has revealed to him, that he can see these two events. We might say the birth of the Christian church or the empowering of the Christian church at Pentecost when the Spirit was given uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ as a gift that was given to him by the Father. And then ultimately, ultimately that day when Christ shall come with the clouds and every eye shall see him. It is interesting to note that verses 28 to 32 in chapter 2 of Joel, in the Hebrew Bible, these verses form a chapter by themselves. And in the Hebrew Bible, there are four chapters of Joel. And this one here that I'm referring to, verses 28 to 32, is the third chapter. And with our chapter 3 being there, chapter 4. To help us again to focus our minds, we must notice that this prophecy here is concerned with the last days. Now, the last days began with the coming of Christ, with the first coming of Christ. That's when the last days began. The last days are not to be regarded as the, as the days immediately before the Lord Jesus returns. They may well be accurately described as the last of the last days. But we today, regardless of where we are as far as God's calendar is concerned, we are in the last days. The last days began when Christ came in the beginning. As Hebrews tells us, the opening verses of Hebrews in chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us, unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And when you're looking at prophecy, always keep that in mind. We're in the last days. We're in them. You're part of them. 
This is the last days. This is the day of the gospel. This is a day of time and of opportunity when people hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. They hear about this glorious person. They hear that this one came from heaven. They hear about his incarnation, about his birth, about his life, about his teaching. And they also hear about his sufferings and they hear supremely about his, his death and his resurrection and his ascension and glorifi glorification. They hear all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a day and this is a time of opportunity. This is the last days. Or these are the last days. And this is our opportunity to get right with God through believing, through accepting, through trusting upon the Lord Jesus and casting our lot in with him. Now is the day. Now is the accepted hour. Well, <clears throat> what are we to notice then? Well, first of all, before the great day of the Lord, remember our title is Expecting the Day of the Lord. Well, before that day will come, before that day could possibly come, the Spirit was poured out. The Spirit was poured out. And that basically is what these verses at the end of chapter 2 from verse 28 to 32, that is basically what these verses are saying, what Joel looked forward to or what Joel saw in his prophecy. He saw that great and wonderful day in Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out. Now we have to realize, and we must keep in our minds and memories, the fact that the Holy Spirit was active and was given in the Old Testament. All these believers, like David, like Moses, like the prophets, all of them had the Holy Spirit of God. They could never be a believer unless they were regenerated. They had the Holy Spirit. But what we find in the New Testament is there's a greater measure, there's a greater outpouring of the Spirit. In the Old Testament, it was only certain people that had the, the, the Spirit to help them and to enable them. But that was changed when, when the Pentecost came. Do we not find here that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy? What happened? Well, the Holy Spirit came upon 120 of the believers. The Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles later on in Cornelius' his household and in Samaria and in Ephesus. The Holy Spirit was poured out. Not only in regeneration that every Christian knows, but in the, the miraculous operations of the Spirit that not every Christian knows. But nevertheless, in New Testament times, that happened far more than it ever did in the Old Testament. And here was something that was going to happen before the second coming of the Lord Jesus, that this great outpouring of the Spirit upon old men, young men, men, women, boys and girls, that's what happened. And that is what is continuing to happen today to some extent. Not we do not believe in the extraordinary uh, pouring out of the Spirit, whereby people speak in tongues or they perform miracles like they did in the first century? No. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit is given far more profusely in the New Testament period, in the period that we're in now, than ever happened before in the Old Testament. And if you're switched on at all and you're thinking about Pentecost, you will go to Peter's sermon there. And you will find that he almost quotes these words verbatim that we find here at the end of chapter 2. And he quotes that because the people had heard the, heard the believers speaking in tongues. And some said, some of the crowd said, these men are drunk. But Peter says, no, they're not drunk. No person who's drunk can speak a foreign language. 
someone who's drunk can hardly speak at all. And no, Peter tells him this is what the prophet Joel said would happen. And that's what happened at Pentecost. The Spirit was poured out like never before, like never in the Old Testament. Glorious gospel times had begun. And it began by an outpouring of the Spirit. And of course, as you know, there was 3,000 conversions that day. And on another day, we're told that some 5,000 were added to the church. And the church made tremendous advances in a very short space of time. So that we're told in, in the book of Acts that these are the men, the apostles like Paul, these were the ones who turned the world upside down. That's what happened. How did they manage to turn the world upside down? They turned the world upside down because the Spirit was poured out in a manner and in a measure that never happened before in the Old Testament. Never was this happened to God's people before. Something glorious and something wonderful had happened. That's the time we're living in, friends. That's it. This is it. The last days. Glorious gospel days. The church progressing with a few fishermen, few uneducated, unlearned individuals with not a bank balance between them, not a building between them, nothing whatsoever, nothing but the power and the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. Truly gospel days. Well, Joel prophesied of that day. And he's telling us here that that day had to happen. The Spirit had to be poured out before that other great day would come when the Lord Jesus Christ would return in great power and glory. And therefore, we are to realize that we're in the day of grace. This is the time. This is the opportunity. This is when we must come to the Lord Jesus. This is when we must cast ourselves upon him. This is when we must em embrace the gospel. This is when we, we must be found in Christ, having him as our own Lord and as our own Savior. In the day when the Spirit is poured out. Well, secondly, he then goes on to talk about judgment being poured out. Judgment being poured out. And here we are, friends, we are compressing many, many centuries. Our first heading really dealt with the first century, the outpouring of the Spirit in the gospel church and the progress that the church had made. But now, if you like, we're going at least 2,000 years down the line. Who knows? Maybe 3,000 years, 4,000 years. Who knows? These things we don't know. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, when he walked upon the earth, he said he did not know the day nor the hour when he would return. He didn't know this in his humanity. He certainly knew it in his divinity, yes. But he didn't know that day in his humanity when he would return. But here we are given a prophecy. Here we're given, told what it will be like. When he's about to return, we are told judgment shall be poured out. And we find that really from verses 1 to 17 of chapter 3. What does he say here? He talks about <coughs> verse 11, for instance, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. The word Jehoshaphat means the judgment of the Lord 
or Jehovah has judged. The Lord is going to summon the people and the nations of the world in some sense to a great day of judgment. The book of Revelation tells us that on that day the judge will be the Lord Jesus Christ. That day has been appointed. That judge has been appointed. And he will be there on his great white throne. And before him shall be all the people of the nations, all who were living at the time when he returns, and all who have lived before. They shall come out of their graves, and they shall be assembled there, we are told, at the valley of Jehoshaphat. This valley of Jehoshaphat, we cannot accurately pinpoint it or determine what place it is. Some maintain it's the plain of Esralion, Esralion, which was famous for the great victories of Barak over the Canaanites and of Gideon over the Midianites. But it was also famous for two great disasters, the death of Saul and of Josiah. So that place that the Valley of Jehoshaphat could well be that place where great um, notable battles were fought for the people of Israel in times past. It could be referred to that what we read there in Revelation chapter 16, it could be referred as the Battle of Armageddon. That certainly refers to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ shall return. The point that we want to notice and we want to establish that it will be, will be a day when judgment will be poured out, when the Lord Jesus Christ shall sit as God's judge, and there mankind will face divine justice, perfect divine justice. It will be an awesome day. It will be a terrible day. It will be the day when the Lord alone shall be glorious. It will be a day when everyone shall be silenced. And regarding this day of judgment, Joel gives three important announcements that we would all be wise to consider. He tells them to prepare for judgment. Verses 1 to 8 of chapter 3. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and so on. He's giving them intimation. He is reminding them. And this section here may well deal with the fact that in history, the people of God, the Jews, were, well, were dealt very badly by many of the nations round about them. And here we find that the Lord remembers what the nations did, and he will repay them. He will repay them. And of course, we can apply this to the Christian era. And how often are the people of God badly treated? How many of the people of God are beheaded because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And people think nothing of it. That Christians lose their lives or their livelihood simply because they belong to Christ? Governments think nothing of it. Other religions think nothing of persecuting Christians. But God has a different view. And he will have a day when these things will be put right. And he's therefore telling the nations. And of course he's telling us, here tonight, you, me, there's going to be a day of judgment. And the Christian will not, not escape it. Of course, it will not be a day of condemnation for the Christian. No, that is true. Why is that true? Well, it's true because the Lord Jesus Christ has soaked up all the condemnation that belongs to us. 
He was condemned in our room and in our place on Calvary. And God is our righteous God. And God will never condemn those who have been condemned in Christ. But nevertheless, the Christian will face judgment, but not condemnation on that day. And he tells them, <coughs> the nations, to prepare for war. What, where do we find that? Verses 9 to 15. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. What he's saying there is, arm yourselves. Come. You're going to fight against God. You better be ready. You better prepare yourselves. This is going to be a great day when you will be against God. And let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak deny their weakness and let them come forward and say they're strong because they're going to fight against Almighty God. It is, a, it is a warning, it is a notification, but it is also a command. He's going to bring all the nations together. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. It goes on there. Multitudes, multitudes, in verse 14, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Let not anyone think that that verse is talking about a time when people are gathered before the Lord and they can make some decision to side with the Lord. By the time this comes, friends, it's too late. By the time this comes, it's too late. Who's making the decision? It's the Lord. He is going to decide, and he will decide the eternal destiny of those that are gathered before him. Today, friends, now is the day of oh, to be accepted before God. This is the day of grace, not this time here. The only one who's going to be deciding is what the Lord has decreed. Not us or not anyone else. God is, in fact, calling them forward to receive his sentence. There'll be no pleading, no bargaining, nothing to be said. God alone will speak. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. What we are looking at here, friends, and we are only touching the surface of it, is the study of end times. And it's called in theology, eschatology. Eschatology, the, stu the study of end times. And uh, there are three principal things, really, that are touched upon in this day of judgment. And they're all related. It is the coming of the Lord Jesus, the second coming. Then there is the resurrection. And then there is the day of judgment. All of these are inextricably linked together. You can, they are separate events, but they're all coming together. They're all in one. And this is what's happening here. The Lord has come. Christ has come with all his chosen ones. He has come in power and in great glory. He has come not to deal with sin like he did the first time, as the book of Hebrews reminds us. No, he has come the second time. And what's he going to do? He's going to deal with the sinner. Sin has been dealt with 2,000 years ago when Christ cried out, it is finished. But now he's going to deal with the sinner. And in order to do that, he must come. He must come to earth. And he does. And then the resurrection. When the graves give up their dead. When the sea gives up its dead. And all are before him. And that awesome day. 
when he's in judgment. Oh, the Savior, who is the Savior now, will be the judge and destroyer on that day. What a thought. It is therefore a warning to us. Thirdly, finally, briefly we would notice from verses <coughs> really 17 to the end of chapter 3, we have after that day. We have been expecting the day of the Lord, but it has now come. Judgment has come. Christ has come. The resurrection has passed. Judgment has been performed. What then? Well, the blessings are poured out. In verse 18, for instance, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. What's he talking about there? Well, he's talking about glorious provision. If you go back to the beginning of the book, there was a famine, there was a dearth. But now, everything's changed. Glorious provision. Plenty of wine, plenty of milk, plenty of waters. There's fertility all around. The whole place has been transformed. He is using temporal themes and temporal words to remind us of the eternal state. What happens after judgment? When the wicked have been dealt with and when the righteous are with Christ in a renewed heaven and a new earth. Glorious, wonderful provision. We're not to think on these temporal terms. We won't be needing wine or milk or waters as they did in the Old Testament times and as we do today. But that's what it's talking about. That's the picture that's before us. Judgment's gone. Evil's been overcome. The devil has been thrown into the lake of fire. Sin has been confined to the annals of history. It's now glory. And there'll be wonderful provision. Egypt shall be a desolation. Egypt was a long-standing enemy of the people of God. Edom, likewise, a desolate wilderness, all gone forever and forever. It should whet our appetites, friends. It certainly would have whet the appetite of Joel. He was living through <coughs> devastation. Locusts caused devastation. Drought, devastation. The promised land, barren, like a wilderness. But with the eye of prophecy, he saw glorious things. Will you be part of it? You can only be part of it if you have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Expecting the day of the Lord we expect it. We don't know when. This same Jesus shall return in like manner. That's what the angel said to the disciples as they watched Jesus being taken from them up into glory. This same Jesus shall return. That's our great hope. We should therefore be expecting the day of the Lord. Amen. And may God be pleased to bless his word to us. Let us pray together.